evening, everyone, and welcome to the Transformation Catalyst webinar series brought to you by Gagan McDonald and Innovisor. Today is the first webinar in the series, and your presenters are Greg Voller, Senior Director from Gagan McDonald, and Richard Lalleman, Head of Learning, Innovation, and Quality at Innovisor. Today's webinar is scheduled to run for one hour. We will be fielding questions, so please use the Q&A box that you see in the bottom right of the screen. We may not get to all of your questions during the session, but we'll make every effort to respond after the session if we can. Today's session is being recorded and we will share a link afterwards so you can watch this again. And without further ado, I will hand it over to our two wonderful presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Hi, everyone. It's such a great pleasure to be with you all here today. Uh, again, my name is Greg Voller, and uh, I'm just excited to uh, uh, be part of this journey with you. I'm going to hand it over to Richard for him to introduce himself and get us going forward here. Yeah. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, and hello, everybody. Um, it's great to see that many people here already, and I know more to come. So uh, we are very excited, and I hope you too. Um, so welcome and enjoy today's session. Yeah. Um, but before we start the session of, of today, um, uh, I actually want to listen more to you, the people who are here in, in, the, in the call. So, um, so that's the reason why we wanted to start off, Greg and I, with a, with a little poll, understanding um, from you how many change initiatives are currently being uh, run inside your company today. And I will give you a, a couple of seconds to uh, to read through it and click on the most um, yeah the most correct uh, answer for uh, on, on this poll. Um, the reason why we do this is that we're going to use this also in the in the session further on. So, how many change initiatives are currently running inside your company today? And for those who just joined in, we are starting with a little poll. So uh, if you can start answering this question, how many change initiatives are currently running inside your company today? That will be great for us as an input for our session. Great, I can see that uh, the answers are dropping in. So let me start to move to the next slide and probably we can see more ans answers coming in but um here we can see already that um we have a variety of of, of answers but from uh, one to 20 initiatives at the same time in the organization isn't uh, um yeah it is the, it is the normal almost you can say here right so uh, great thank you for uh, for showing this because the reason why we start off with asking you this question is that um, uh, the fact is you and your company are, are all faced with two relentless or intense factors that makes it very difficult to succeed with change. And these factors are not only relevant for the large companies or the companies who see themselves working in more competitive environments than others. It is everywhere, no matter the size, no matter the industry, no matter the geography. Change is an integral, in, integ uh, integral part of, of really every or company. And let me give you just a couple of examples. Uh, one such example is that companies go through structural changes, like two companies merging with each other, which is, by the way, the topic of our third webinar hosted by Gagan McDonald and, and Innovisor. But another example is that companies can also go through cultural changes, like, for example, companies who are faced with a high turnover and want to make sure the culture of their yeah, lower tenured employees uh, is aligned with the company's long term vision and mission. And it is, of course, not that you do one or the other in a company, many companies and perhaps also yours and looking at the numbers, probably also yours. Uh, are actually working on both types of change projects. And then also at the same time. And then I even forgot to mention uh, running digital transformation initiatives, right? So 
what we can conclude is that the volume of initiatives is huge. And this brings me to the second relentless factor, which is all about the velocity of initiatives. You are not yet done with the implementation implementation of one uh, change initiative, while others have already initiated. And this means that organizations really need to have a nimble and impact, uh, impactful approach to help see the compounding changes uh, uh, occurring. And often it is impacting really the same people in the organization. All right, thank you, Richard. So this brings together really what we list out as the first of three challenges. Uh, and again, this whole focus is about how you build up and increase your evidence-based focus around driving change in your organization. So look at this statistic. This is a KPMG statistic. 96% of executives say their organizations are planning or already executing some level of business transformation. So that's, that's even much higher than what all of you are indicating on your data and results. So here's the thing, with such a preponderance, such a heavy focus on transformation, relate that to this next statistic. So the Project Management Institute, a well-known worldwide global organization that focuses on how organizations drive projects in their organizations, says only 46% of all organizations have a project uh, a, a project focus within their culture. So right now, already, we're starting to see the discrepancies between organizations with an, with an intent to make change to evolve, and then their true capability in order to make that happen through a focused, a structured, a thoughtful, and what we're gonna talk about now is in a very human type of way as well. So that's our first challenge that Richard and I wanna share with you. Now we're gonna go into our next challenge. And in order to uh, tee that up, we'd like to also gain some more inputs from you. So from this list, there's 10 items here. We'd love to hear from you. What have been some of the primary challenges that your organization has faced in, uh, in terms of leading successful change? So we'd love for you to review this list, pick up to three of these options about the primary challenges your organization has to successful change. So you can go ahead right now, please. You can pick up to three of those items there. Just check the box, please. And I think you have to pick up to three in order for your um, submissions to be counted there. There we go. Now I see I'm starting to float in. I'm going to give it another few seconds here. We'll give you another 10 seconds or so to make your final choices here. Okay, so in the interest of time, we have nearly, now we just hit 60% of, of you all providing. And as I just string this statement out one more time, maybe a few more come in, let's take a look at what you're saying here. All right, so let's take a look at this and let's look, uh, let's look deeply at this. So a range of perspectives here. And so my eyes drawn to the fact that some of the largest, the most significant challenge you have is related to culture. That is um, teeing up our discussion and presentation very nicely here. And so we'll talk more about what does that mean from an evidence-based perspective. Uh, secondly, that I see here is the unclear about how we're going to change. What is the approach? What is the, what is the journey that we will be taking? And how are we thinking about that from a series of experiences, not just a series of activities then as well too. And then I think just as I do put a quick scan on this, um, the third highest challenge is a fuzzy description of where we're going. What is that destination looking like? We see so many organizations that believe they have to have a fully crystallized view of their future, when in reality, they just need to have a structured view uh, of, their, of where they're going from a destination perspective. 
Let's take a quick glance at maybe what's not as much of a challenge for you. Um, it looks like a uh, combination of governance at 10%, um, confidence in the transformation or change team to drive change, and the next is around the lack of the rationale or the why. All right, so really helpful, really helpful perspective. And I'm gonna go back to some of the things you said around culture and unclear how we're going to change to go to our next challenge. Because what we see uh, from a Gagan McDonald perspective and in connection with Innovisor is that overlooking that human dimension of change will always, always, always diminish the value of your organizational transformation. And I think we can all feel that, we all sense that, you know, as in the organizations that we're part of or the organizations that we serve, we can recognize when, when the human dimension is not being counted at a strong enough level. And, and while it may be hard for us to quantify it, we can certainly feel and experience that. Well, that being said, um, I'm gonna take a, 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 a opportunity to try to help quantify that to some degree for all of you. And so I wanna share with you this next equation. And I will very much cite the source that this comes from General Electric and the GE Change Acceleration Program. And I'll build this out here for you on the slide here. That as we go through this, the results that you are looking for in any transformation or change or project for that matter, it's a factor, it, it equals two factors. It's the quality of the solution times and multiplied by the people acceptance and adoption of that solution. And if you really think about that, you know, in a very simplistic terms of, of, of the work that is done in organizations where everything is put into what is that quality of the solution, just think about and consider just what part of the work product, the work focus is put into people acceptance and adoption. And because this is a multiplication factor, when you have lower focus on that people acceptance and adoption, you are already sub-optimizing your results because a low number, a low A here is going to create and minimize the quality of your solution. And maybe as you think about that a little bit more, I would have just sort of ask you to think about where are you spending your time? Where is your organization focusing its energies? And is it on people acceptance and adoption at a strong enough level or frankly, does your investment really in quality of solution become the dominant part of your organization and your approaches to how you work there as well too? So again, as we talked about this being very evidence-based change, we firmly believe that as you drive change in your organization, you can find elements of evidence, particularly around this big A, the acceptance and adoption of the solution and how you can create a focus on readiness that is impacting um, attitudes uh, beliefs and behaviors in your organization at a quantitative level. In fact, let's look at that a little bit deeper. Because at the end, end uh, um, at the end of most activities, the reality is is that um, one of the biggest opportunities and challenges that often is underserved is the fact that people resistance is not managed well. And so, when we look at really unpacking acceptance and adoption and think about really what are the elements and the components of that, we think about the fact that it's a combination of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And when the combination of those collectively can be greater than what's always gonna be there is resistance, then you have opportunity to truly make an impact on acceptance and adoption. And something we always need to remember as it relates to resistance is that it is natural occurring we all are resistance to change to some level, even the most, even the most um, 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 assertive and aggressive of us who love change, there still is some level of resistance that we have as individuals. So what we need to be thoughtful about in this resistance equation is what are the people that were being impacted? What, is, what are they looking to overcome? And how are we always, again, from an evidence-based perspective, understanding what they are looking to overcome? It's not what we think they are looking to overcome, what are they looking to overcome in this approach and in this process then as well too? So again, wrapping this back into our second challenge is how do you look from an evidence-based perspective, how do you look to understand resistance? And then how do you look as you understand resistance, what are your opportunities to effectively manage and lead through resistance as well too? 
right, I'm jumping back over to Richard for our third challenge. Yes, thank you. So let me. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me oh, go. There you go. Go ahead. Yep. yep. Uh, let me. Uh, um, um, yeah. Start with you uh, with asking a question again through a poll, uh, and when this time is about uh, the, the the third challenge and and about uh, who who you truly think uh, influence your attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors inside your organization. So. Reflecting back on the previous change initiatives you have been a part of, um, yeah, where did the influence really come from in the organization? So again, we give you a couple of uh, seconds to um, to pick pick up two, and then um, submit them. And then, if we are halfway, I will just show you the results. From this little pole. Yes, we are getting close to that one. So let me uh, flip it through. Um, so I like the, the way uh, Greg uh, actually uh, analyzed the previous uh, results from uh, from the poll by looking at okay w w where where can we see the high scores uh, on this one and here we can see that uh, uh, people are getting really um, influenced by the colleagues and the peers uh, it, it turns out here in this in this in this room which is really excellent uh, which is also something we are going to talk about more uh, in detail. Uh, but on the other hand, you also see still the senior leaders who are uh, yeah, um, very influential to most of these um, uh, change initiatives. So uh, really great input. Good. Um, because this is actually really good input. Um, uh, I, I know the, the, the answer of this poll, and, and, and it is based on, on innovator research from the past 15 plus years. And this is really research about how influence flows inside organizations. And the answer to this research, however, isn't something completely new. It is a practice that was already recognized almost 200 years ago by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln knew exactly what the key persuasion principle was. And, and this is how he actually won the electoral campaigns back in 1840. 1840. Um, uh, because he knew that uh, by persuading the undecided, you need to send in someone they trust. And the reason why I've put the word they in bold is that it was not someone you trust, they trust. And now reflecting back on the results that we just got from you through, through the poll, it is the peers and the colleagues you trust um, um, uh, that, that influence your, your, your behavior. But this is often something that is neglected while we are working with, with change. So how can we really find the people who are trusted by, by others? It is really about identifying those who carry two key characteristics. You want to identify those who are both sympathetic and competent. Or in this uh, model, we call this uh, the number one in the qu in the quadrant. Uh, but where would you go if you can't go to the sympathetic and competent person or you don't know who the person is? Will you then go to the sympathetic but less competent person? Or will you go to the, uh, to the unsympathetic but more competent person? Or just to put it in the words of uh, 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 Tatiana Sikorovia, in her uh, publication about collaboration, teams, and, and, and formations of social networks, are you going to a lovable fool or to the competent jerk? An innovator experience shows that 70%, 70 seven zero, would rather go to a lovable, lovable fool uh, and 30% to the competent jerk. 
And then when you really look further into this number, it shows that managers tend to lean to the competent jerk, whereas uh, employees go to the lovable fool. So people really lean towards trusting their peers instead of those maybe more up in the hierarchy. And of course, the model also includes the unsympathetic and less competent. And a leader may, may want to know uh, who, who they are, but this is never ever revealed when you look in the in, in, in informal networks of organizations. Because when looking inside these networks, it should be really about a positive experience for the employees and the organization as a whole. And it is therefore much better to look at the positive nominations at, at the number ones of the yeah, uh, inter uh, uh, or the internal influences inside your organization. But now the question is, uh, who are these number ones? Um, now I I went through. Let me see. Um, so who are those number ones? Um, um, who are those trusted by uh, 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 trusted by the others? Uh, first, they are not extroverts, and again. In the, the 15 plus years of experience, they are most of the case introverts rather than the extroverts. And I, I believe this is, a, this, this is simple because if you have a serious question, you would like to ask, uh, to, to ask someone or you want to make sense of, then where would you go to? Would you go to a person that is just waiting for the moment where you pass a single second so that uh, that person then can give give you their opinion or would you go to a person that is more listening reflecting and then coming back to you with a carefully considered opinion most of the people actually go to the latter letter and secondly the number one or those internal influencers are not high performers we never have found a link between being an internal influencer and being a high performer and this is often a big surprise for the executives with who we uh, work with, but actually not so much uh, a surprise for the non-executives. But why is there no link? Think about this. When you are appointed as a high-performing uh, high employee uh, by management, your colleagues will immediately view you in a different way. You are special, and as a result, you do not conform to them. You are not part of the tribe. So again, that is the reason, or that is what we believe is the reason um, influencers are often not the high performers. And thirdly and finally, they are also not tenured. And why is this? It's because the more tenured employees, uh, uh, the more tenured you are as an employee, uh, the, the more stronger your network you already have in your organization. They have used their brain capacity already to build the connections with other tenured colleagues. So if they should create a relationship to you as a new joiner, for example, they first need to yeah, remove someone from their existing network. Um, and, and, and this is, of course, very different from new joiners. Um, some are just excellent and more open to building new connections and they don't have the existing network yet. So therefore, uh, the internal influencers are always, uh, also often uh, uh, new joiners in a company. So now you know everything about what your influencers not are. Um, and also that managers and employees just have different ways to make sense of what's happening in a company. Um, so how to identify these number ones? Because this is not, it's not enough to know who the number ones are or who those inf uh, informal influences are. You really need to take in co into consideration the network. Some may have overlapping ne networks and persuading each other. And you want to make sure you actually get in all the tribes of the network. You want to know the number ones who do not have overlapping networks. And that is what the Innovisor 3% rule algorithm does. It identifies the smallest group of people who drive the perceptions of the largest share of the organization. And from our experience, we have seen that it takes 
on average 3% to influence or persuade up to 90% of an organization. And for comparison, if you look at a company uh, and you look to those that have the formal uh, responsibility to influence others, like the leaders and the managers, is roughly 12% of a workforce, they only impact 45 to 50% of the employees. And as a, on a final note, the 3% who influence up to 90% is something we see across all types of companies. So whether you are a small or a large scale company or a manufacturing or a life science company, the same patterns refuse at each time. So the real change is actually driven by a very um, a small group of people inside your company. Um, if you do not have the 3% on board, you will really fail to have the, the, the rest with you. And it's because the perceptions and the feelings that they have that are really contagious to the others, to, the, to those who are influenced by them. So now try to let's uh, think back to the, to the poll that we ran earlier about those, um, um, those two relentless factors we are dealing with. Because we are faced with many change initiatives and these initiatives also need to be done very quickly because the next is in the waiting room already. You therefore really need to have a shortcut to the point where change becomes self-sustaining, which is when 30% of your company actually made a change. So the longer it takes to get to this point, the higher the prob prob probability is that your change initiative fails. So the shortcut to shape the perceptions of all the tribes inside your organization uh, in a fast way is actually through the 3% uh, the rule that, uh, I er that I mentioned earlier on this one. So... Now I've given you uh, 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 yeah, a bit of background on the third uh, challenge. So I want to give it back to Greg, Greg, who starts on the final part of this webinar. And that is really all about how can you change and sustain the human behavior? Greg. All right, thank you, Richard. So just to recap, so we have these three challenges that we've shared with you. Number one, the volume and velocity of change in organizations. And we all know, team, it's not getting any, uh, any slower or lighter. The second challenge is in terms of how you lead and well, how you identify and lead through resistance. And this third challenge that Richard just shared with you is really understanding and identifying the true influencers in your organization and recognizing that most organizations do not have not gotten that correct here over, over, over these past years and even more so during these recent times as well. So with these three challenges comes the opportunity for how do you then understand those and then um, move forward from those to create solutions that can truly impact change in your organization. So we're gonna share with you just a couple of perspectives, a couple of applications here within this then as well too, and give you some ways to think about how you can, um, how you can drive success for, uh, change forward within your organization, not just to hit an initial milestone, but to um, uh, keep momentum going forward and sustain that type of change activity as well. Um, before I do that, certainly I see some of you um, asking questions in, in the Q&A. Please, your questions are encouraged and we will come back and address them a bit later here in our discussion. So where we have a strong opinion from a Gagan McDonald viewpoint is that with so many different methods, methodologies that um, exist throughout the world about how to help an organization drive and sustain change, we really believe that there are core components, core elements of all methodologies. And to humanize that, we really bring that forward in the notion of what we believe that there are truly three things that ultimately change everything. And the first of those elements um, that are interdependent with each other is your compelling story. And it frames together what we learned earlier from you. It frames together the rationale, what's happening in the marketplace, and then what is the opportunity and the destination that we have to come to life. And within that, what is the journey that we're going to be taking for that? And notice this use of the word compelling. We always say this, 
the true indicator of a story that's compelling, it's not the organization. Compelling is from the viewpoint of the people that you're looking to impact. So is the story compelling from their viewpoint? It's a significant component of this. Another aspect of the three things that change everything is the focus, the alignment and the accountability and commitment of leaders. And in so many organizations, we recognize that leaders are well-intended. We also recognize though they, 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 at a next level, they may not, and more often they do not have a clarity in terms of what their role is in leading transformation. And so we look at that as a critical element here. And then the third piece is an intentional experience roadmap that brings together not just the listing of activities, but takes it to a next level of what are the experiences that are being shaped and created and delivered and activated within your organization as well too. So it's these three components that are the starting blocks, if you will, for how we look at really impacting long lasting change within an organization. And there's how these all come together. These are all very interdependent with each other. Um, none is more relevant or important than each other. They all three have to come together into a change ecosystem to one of the questions that we'll get to either to set the conditions for effective change within an organization then as well too. All right, so that's the starting viewpoint. Now we wanna take it to a next even more practical level. And we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about both blockers of change and then levers to help navigate change. And so I'm gonna turn this back over to Richard and he's gonna talk um, first about, uh, from, a, uh, from his perspective, what in their experience have seen are absolute obstacles and blockers of change. I'm gonna come back and then talk about what are specific levers that can be um, looked at in combination to really help you move forward within a change, a successful change environment as well too. Richard, you want to go ahead, please? Yes. Thank you, Greg. Yes. So InnoVisor has in the um, last three to four years studied and analyzed the patterns and signals in our change data. And um, that is data that is really from the past 15 years. And our objective with that was really to revolutionize how to succeed with change together with your people. And in this work, we identified, so therefore, the six change blockers, which you must mitigate if you really want to change, win. And here you can see those six blockers of change. Uh, the first two are really network uh, focused. So you have the leadership cohesion. So how well are the leadership teams working as one, being the role model to the rest of the organization? Again, reflects back to what we earlier saw on the poll that see, still the senior leaders are critical uh, for, for influencing uh, the change or the, the behavior. But it's also about uh, the organizational network fragmentation. So how fragmented is the organization? Um, because the more fragmented it is, the, the longer it will take for you to implement the right interventions in the organization. So this, those first two are really heavily focused on the networks. Then at the bottom, you have the leadership follow through and the project team set up. And these are more, more about the, the context of how the, the, the change initiatives are executed within your organization. Um, so um, so how, how much time do people actually um, have for this change initiative? Because even though you may be a change management practitioner, you only have maybe 10% or 20% of, of your time on this one particular change initiative that is rolled out in your organization. That is, of course, a blocker. <laughs> the less time you have uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the initiative. Also, the leaderships follow through. Uh, are they dedicated to really uh, implement an action plan to yeah, uh, change the behavior and attitudes of, of the rest of the organization? Or are they going to move move forward and see it more as a checkbox activity? And then in the middle, you have the perceptions uh, and the alignment uh, of the key stakeholders or the, the, the 3%, because uh, not only uh, influence the 3% up to 90% of your organization, they are also your really early warning si signal in the organization. So if they are not aligned, 
um, um, uh, to your um, to your changes, or they don't feel very positive about wh- what what the what the road is for what the future is of the organization. Then they will uh, they will influence the rest, and that is creating a resistance for you that you need to mitigate. Um, so so these are really the six um, um, uh, blockers that we have, and then. For the sake of being very practical in this session, I uh, would like to uh, turn it over to Greg and actually use one of these um, uh, uh, blockers of change, like the perception of the 3% and how then actually the, the levers of, of uh, Giga McDonald's um, um, yeah, and the enablement of change can work with that. All right, thank you, Richard. Richard, can I get your help with something, please, to actually bring this to even more practical life for all of our uh, audience? So um, there are several questions in our queue, and uh, June and Dorian are asking, I think, helpful questions here to really bring this to a practical application. And so, um, Richard, I'm gonna ask if you, you know, June is asking to give a real life example of the 3% rule, and Dorian is asking, what are some of the um, common common traits that the 3% have. So maybe if you could share just a little bit about that, then we'll go into then um, this particular opportunity when that is, a, that is a blocker as well too, please. Yes, so uh, June, just to um, answer one, uh, your question about a practical example. So let's take, for example, uh, a company with 300 people where they also went through um, uh, a, a culture change initiative. Um, so they needed to have uh, the air on the ground on um, what what pe- how people actually perceive the culture before they all, uh, before they actually started to roll out a new culture initiative. Um, so they actually used the three percent to uh, to co-create with them um, the new set of culture rules almost. Uh, so rather than to impose it over them. Uh, without in, in interfering uh, the three percent, uh, they actually listened to them, listened, listened, and then actually um, uh, used their input um, in a way so that uh, they also felt that they were listened to, as well as they could also they felt empowered, and were also being more the the uh, the shortcut for you to to get to all those different tribes in the organization. To to uh, to get the new culture um, um, everywhere in the organization. So that is one one example that uh, that that I can give you. And then Doreen, um, yeah, those um, character threats and level of seniority. I think it's all like what I mentioned earlier with the informal uh, influences, who they are not. Uh, so, so, so they are also young. The the, the younger generation inside the organization, they are also um, 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 yeah the people who are actually not on the HR list as as uh, high performing uh, uh, practitioners. So, yeah. So I think if you remove the word "not" from all the statements that I used earlier, um, uh, these are the uh, characteristics of an informal uh, informal influencer. Yeah, I hope thank you. it clarifies. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Richard. And for sure, if others have more questions, please feel free to insert them into the Q&A um, and we'll be happy to respond to them. So let's just unpack that now as Richard just shared that. And, you know, in this blocker that Richard is describing notes that organizations, frankly, have resistance to the 3% rule. So said in different terms, you know, um, and what Richard is saying is that you know, organizations believe that power is position in an organization, um, that tenure maybe has stronger influence than folks that have lesser tenure and can go down to almost sort of any sort of sort of cultural belief or dem- about demographics within an organization. These are all elements that feed into a resistance, if you will, around really, again, identifying and ed- identifying the true influencers and then equipping them. So I wanted to give that context here as we now think about, you know, again, something we said earlier is that how you are looking at the combination of attitudes, beliefs and behaviors and how they overcome resistance is your opportunity to pull your levers 
to help you really drive change. So let me explain this, this model here then as well too. So I first wanna start on the outside and really that, that constant flow orbit around really starting at the top with experiences that you shape in an organization. So experiences um, come together from all of the, the, the activity and the micro experiences that any employee has through her or his day, through her or his week, not only just within an organization, but those outside influences then as well too. Those experiences shape beliefs. And then those beliefs frame thinking in an organization, in an individual, excuse me. And then thinking impacts the actions that people choose to do and that they frankly choose not to do. And then from there, you get the results that you are looking for. And by the way, this is a constantly flowing cycle here. It does, doesn't happen just once, it happens over and over and over again. Well, within that framework, within that flow, if you will, are these six levers that are represented as opportunities from where you, from when you identify, you know, resistance at an individual level to get to a little bit of what Giselle is asking, but then also too, to set the conditions for what effective change is. These are then levers that you can pull to help reduce, mitigate resistance. Notice I'm gonna say something. You're never gonna eliminate resistance from change. That is a fallacy that never happens. What you are trying to do is manage and reduce resistance to tolerable levels for the resistance factors you have now. And then, so, and then you understand what, um, and have clarity on what the new resistance factors are when they come into the equation. So these six levers, um, ranging all the way from your values um, at, at a very uh, framing sense for your organization and how that aligns with specific behaviors um, that are expected within your organization and the accountability around those behaviors, which feeds into a systematic view, if you will, around um, systems that uh, advance, encourage, drive accountability and, um, and reward that then as well too. And you have symbols everywhere. These are more than just the visuals. You have symbols in terms of how, uh, how decision-making is made in your organization. What is the symbolic way that people interpret how, how decisions are made in your organization? How is information shared? That's another symbol-like type of opportunity for you. And a lot of that flows into your focus on information sharing and communication. And what is the multi-way approach to communication, not just from the company to employee, but it's really a sort of that omni-channel-like type of way that information mm -hmm. frankly now flows in today's world. And the last of these six that I haven't mentioned yet is all wrapped around energy. And so much, so much in today's world is, is, is a focus on, on, on people's energy and the energy that not only are they willing to give, but the energy that they gain from within an organization then as well too. So when you look at an example like Richard just shared with us, where there is resistance to, um, to what he and Innovisor proposes as this 3% rule and recognizing what the sources of those resistance are, how do you pull the levers, if you will, in a combination of communicating in a clear and effective way of, of elevating the symbols, the symbols that um, that focus on contribution and influence of people, and frankly, in this particular example, less on their position and authority, to maybe focus on those individuals that are part of 3% that actually are energy givers to your organization, compared to those individuals that frankly may deplete others' energy in an organization and so far. So it's understanding the blocker, it's understanding the impact on people, and what that means for how they look at change and why they resist change. And then looking at these combination of levers and saying, we can pull together maybe uh, items within all six of these levers to bring forward then a way that we truly are reducing resistance and we're growing, we're, get, we're, we're focusing on progress and we're making true change happen in our organization as well too. So, six blockers and six lovers. And so the numbers line up, but they don't necessarily equate to each other. It's just a recognition that um, those specific items that happen in your organization, there are ways that you can then, um, um, you can manage them as you go forward. A Couple more thoughts on this, and then we're gonna get to more of your questions. So um, I just wanted to share just a few additional perspectives. 
we see so many organizations putting together, you know, their activity roadmaps in a very thoughtful, um, a, a thoughtful, somewhat assumed type of way. And what we would what we would challenge organizations to think about is though is what are the experiences that are coming out? This is a fine approach, but it may not get to you the experiences that you're looking to collectively create for for your people overall in an organization. Um, we often share with our clients that it's for all the right reasons, organizations does work within work streams. It's an efficient, effective way to, 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 to package work together, whether it be in a, in a contemporary agile-like type of way to get work done. The thought process is though, is also is how do you take that work and other pieces of work and understand the experience that is being created? An organization works in work streams. People feel and make decisions to change based on their experiences. And so when we understand those, so those dual points of view and understand where the connection points are, that's your opportunity. And the reality is, and you all know this, is that in any organization, there's just is not one human inside your organization. Um, oh, and that's supposed to be a video that is actually just not playing, but there are many different types of individuals within your organization. And yes, there's a demographic difference between folks, but I would also encourage you to think about what are those what are those human experience factor differences between individuals? What gives um, in, what gives individuals joy, uh, and what are motivators? What are fears and concerns? Um, what are their wants and needs as it relates to the specific work focus of an organization? And recognize that when you start to think about it from that level of of, of uniqueness within your organization you actually then have an, have an avenue for how you're starting to frame experiences. And that leads to this, uh, to this viewpoint about really codifying human experience factors and recognizing that um, sort of the old traditional way of employee segmentation for communication by location, by role, uh, maybe to some degree by tenure or some other demographic factors, that we need to take a next step forward, a next level up, that we need to address the emotional factors, the human experience factors um, that truly are driving people today. Um, and that from, again, from where they make their decisions, whether to accept or adopt a solution that you're bringing forward as well too. So with that, those are some ways that between Richard and myself, we wanted to bring forward how you can think about providing some, again, evidence-based solution into your organization. Um, and how you think about all of that to catalyze change as you go forward. So with that, oh, I'm going to turn it back over to Hannah, please. Hello, thank you. So just a reminder, we have some great questions coming in, but it's not too late to share your questions with us now. If we don't get through them in the next 12 minutes, we will try our best to answer them after the session. Great, so the first question from the audience during our Q&A for the two of you, how do you distinguish between the actual resistance, which is an individual response, to a system feedback dynamics? So becoming accountable for creating the appropriate system conditions for change and setting, instead of putting it on the individual. Yeah, I, I love that question. And Giuseli, thank you so much for asking that. I'll start and then Richard, if you have comments, please add. Um, and so I, I, I think this is thoughtful. And I, I think it's a combination, truthfully. It's, it, it's a both and in terms of recognizing that, as I mentioned earlier, resistance is ongoing. There's always forms of resistance happening in any, in any part of an organization related to change. And so how do you, number one, as we've talked about, address that, identify and address that. And I think also what you're getting at most critically here is how are you setting the key conditions for change then as you go forward? How are you using those types of levers that we talked about? How are you using and in, in identifying, you know, from Richard's viewpoint, you know, those true influencers and then equipping and enabling them to be successful? There are critical success factors in any change and how you, how you understand them for your organization and create the conditions for those always recognizing that resistance is going to be one of several of those critical success factors. I think that's how you look at it a little bit more holistically overall as well too. So it's really a both and solution would be my response to that. I don't know if Richard, do you have any comments you'd like to add there? 
Yeah. So, so what we also see when we work with uh, with uh, with clients on the three percent rule, for example, is to have different kind of um, uh, um, sessions with um, um, with the influencers one on one, but also uh, in the, in the group wise. And I think this dynamic will also create a dynamic within this key group. Uh, that helps um, uh, uh, helps get resistance away because there will also be resistance in this important group of influencers. Um, so it's really listening on different levels and making sure to integrate as well in your actions and that those actions are uh, shown to them as as well as to the, to the rest of the organization. Wonderful, great Anymore? answers. Yeah. And just before we get to the next question, I would like to remind everyone that we have some wonderful resources from both Innovisor and Gagan down at the bottom that you can download as PDFs. So if you're interested in reading a little bit more on the three things by Gagan or the 3% rule by Innovisor, you can download those and uh, continue your reading after the session. And uh, on to the next. Uh, so we have one comment that love to hear energy as part of the equation it has taken some time for this aspect to reach the C-suite. So my question is, why do you think this has taken so long for energy and people-led change to come to the forefront? I'll, I'll, I'm happy to start there. And Richard, again, certainly um, <laughs> looking forward to your input into that. Um, I think part of the example, and Maria Rosa, thank you for that comment. Um, one of our beliefs is that we are squarely now in an employee first era around the globe. And the COVID uh, component uh, very much punctuated that overall um, in, 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 in really in a global basis as well too. And so what was before that then? You, you, could, you could argue arguably say that for a number of decades, organizations from a quote unquote human capital perspective the primary focus and outcome there that organizations were looking to attain largely focused on engagement, on employee engagement. And that's, a, that's sort of a construct that has existed for decades. I think where we are at now is that we've actually moved beyond engagement and for organizations to understand that in this employee first era, that employees are craving professional fulfillment. And they are speaking um, with their choices about the organizations they decide to um, work for, connect with, stay with accordingly for that then as well too. I think that's a that's all sort of foundation, Maria Rosa, to your no, notion here that that's why I think it's taken a while for this focus on energy to get to um, um, uh, more decision-making levels of an organization, or recognizing that energy and, and what we can give even as all of us are here, uh, all nearly a hundred of us are participating in this virtual experience here. It takes a different form of energy compared to if we were all in a, in a, in a room together and enjoying this conversation as well too. So um, I think those are some driving forces of why it's taken, uh, why we are here today as well too. And I completely agree with you. I'm not gonna add anything to that one, uh, Greg. So uh, yes, thank you for this answer. Wonderful. So what would be your one piece of advice to someone leading a change initiative? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is also often a question we ask our cl clients um, um, when we have an, uh, an interview after, uh, uh, after a project. And it is really about knowing the right people before you actually start to do something, right? Uh, that is really the number one piece of advice that I hear from them because often or not often, but uh, it happens that we are being uh, asked to conduct a network analysis and, and identify the 3% rule um, while they're already within the initiative. And then it shows that they have actually not been effective before uh, uh, they actually uh, uh, worked uh, worked for us, so I think that is a really a, a key um, a key learning uh, from also our clients that we've worked with. And Hannah, Great. I would just oh, would you like oh, uh, I would respond to that. Um, 
uh, there, there's lots of things, but if there's one sort of central piece of advice is that really have an understanding of what the people that you're looking to impact, what are they looking to overcome? And, 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 and challenge yourself to understand that, to identify that, to talk to those, to those stakeholder groups, if you will, and get clarity on what those individuals are looking to overcome. And I think when you, when, you, when you look at that from a very human level like that, I think it gives you so much, so much fuel in terms of how you're gonna be developing and activating your change strategy. Wonderful, thank you. And we have uh, one wonderful comment from Helen that I would like to just share with everyone. Um, her example of the 3% rule, it applies to social media. In her sector, health and healthcare, 85% of content that gets retweeted comes from just 3.3% of people that tweet. So if we wanna get out a message to people across the national healthcare system, they use social analytics to identify the 3.3% to get them to help spread the message. It works way quicker than any formal organizational communication system. So just reinforcing that 3% and using the people first. So thank you for sharing, Helen. Wonderful. So as we wrap up, I just wanted to remind you once again that you can share um, any of these resources from the bottom. We would also like to thank you for your time and a big thank you to Greg and Richard. And finally, Thanks. would like to remind you that our next webinar on culture and connection is on November 4th and our third webinar on, culture, on mergers and acquisitions is happening on November 14th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you register for that. And um, for those asking if we get access to the slide content, the recording will be made available at the end. So I'll just pass it over to our presenters for one last time. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for uh, all the, the great comments and, um, and, and, and questions. And I hope we can continue this conversation also after this, uh, this webinar. And uh, uh, looking to see you uh, on also webinar two and webinar three of this session. And I would just say likewise, um, I'm so excited for all of you because you are there as a catalyst for the organizations you serve. Um, your passion, your energy is paramount. So would just encourage you to find your energy sources. And then closing, I would just say thank you to Richard and to Hannah and for others who have made this, um, have made this session possible. Uh, we've just enjoyed putting it together for you and this opportunity to share it with you as well too. All right, with that, we, wel we wish you a very great rest of your day um, and we encourage you just to make it a great one in whatever, uh, whatever activities you have uh, for the remainder of your day. So thank you again for joining us.